I want to start kind of with a, with somewhat of a look back at, at some of the things that you've done, because you are a very different person now than uh, when I last spoke to you. So and around that time, you just released Heavy Meta. So the per- being the person you are now, how do you look back at that first album of yours? Um, for a period, I, I kind of got in that headspace of, of really being over it and kind of burn out on it and the persona and the songs and everything. But now the more time has passed and I like was able to take some time away from endlessly touring. I kind of look back on it pretty fondly, almost like, Oh, you know, it, almost like a different person Okay, uh, was making the, making those songs and making that record, which is pretty much true. I was drastically kind of different um, in a different headspace when I made that stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned the word persona uh, when you talk about that album. So, so what were the differences? Well, were you kind of still in the early ages of, of early stages of figuring out your identity or what was it kind of, of figuring out how to be a touring musician? Um, definitely both. I mean, I feel like, my sort of identity as a musician was pretty clear cut then because I was really, really sort of headstrong and like passionate about the music I was making and the message that I had. Um, it required a lot of like inner fire and force to like go out there, um, you know, and just kind of like address these really heavy topics, you know, coming from a place of being sort of frustrated with humanity basically. Um, it took a lot of that to like make that record and then go tour and, and those, you know, that first year or two of shows was, they were aggressive. Like it was pretty confrontational. Um, I feel like we would play against the crowd, go out into the crowd. Uh, it was pretty abrasive and acidic, you know, with some humor, but it, it was, it took a lot of energy. Uh, you know, I was in like a, Iggy pop headspace, just okay. like in terms of performance where it was just like destroy, destroy myself for the sake of, uh, okay. of, of the, you know, of the message, I guess. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's where I was at. Well, that's, that's a very interesting thing to talk about that, that notion of the tortured artist that you have to be a certain way or to feel a certain way or be in a certain mood to be able to uh, convey certain emotions or certain uh, yeah creativity or musicality. So how have you found, uh, was that true for you at that time? And have you kind of adjusted that, that view now? Um, I think it was less of the tortured artist thing um, and more of just, I had this really strong inner fire to want to, um, make myself and people want to live better. Mm. Uh, I feel like things at that point were very, there's a lot of complacency. Um, and like everyone was just kind of glazed over with everything, you know, that was kind of going on in the world. And, you know, that complacency has definitely been rattled over the last year or two. Um, but I think I was trying like, back then four years ago, sort of before we were all rattled unintentionally was trying to like evoke that, like, come on people, let's not sink too deep into this, you know, sort of oblivion and try to be conscious about like what we're absorbing, where this is all going. Uh, didn't work, but I tried and, uh, it took, so that's what it was. It was actually a lot about self-preservation. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think I was a self-destructive person, but when I would play, I was like, felt like I was trying to like primally scream, you know, to just get people to like feel something because it felt like people were not, everyone was just kind of like, you know, <laughs> and at least in this country, um, you know, the people in, in Europe touring over there, much more lively, much more, um, personal and and connected and alive but here it's just everyone is just anxious and burned out and Mm. i don't know so yeah yeah what what kind of uh you kind of mentioned it already but what kind of toll that that uh, did that take on you both uh, looking forward in terms of what you wanted to do creatively but also kind of as you were doing it because i can imagine that's the way you carried yourself was could be quite exhausting i suppose it really was it took 
you know, it was like 110% every night that we played. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I used to have a mindset early on in touring where I was like, I want to play every night of the year. Uh, you know, I almost had like a Henry Rollins intensity who okay. I'm a huge fan of. And when I, every time I listen to him talk or read his books, he's so intense and it made me feel good about my own intensity. And that was like, that fire is like what I had. So it really carried me through like that first year. Mm -hmm. I never saw it coming, but I, after doing like multiple records and touring back to back, I hit a wall where I was physically, mentally, emotionally burnt out um, from it. Just mm -hmm. the constant grind and trying to give it my all every night. It was unrealistic. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm grateful because it kind of led to me where, led me to where I am now but I definitely had to kind of crash and burn. It took a toll for sure. How did you, after kind of crashing and burning, what were those next couple of months like for you? Did you kind of just, just shy away from music altogether or did you really need to reset your mind in a way? Yeah, I, I, um, so I met Chiara, my partner, now okay. wife downstairs. We met in Italy. She's Italian. And, and after our, I knew that I needed to, to take a pause. Mm. And, um, so June, 2019, we played our last show of like a three and a half, four year tour in Italy, in her hometown, actually at a festival called beat. Brew. And my plan was I am going to disconnect, get off social media, put the phone away, forget about music, forget about everything and try to just like live in a very simple, small life over there with her. Mm. Go to the beach cook food, spend time in this beautiful country. Um, and that actually got disrupted because some issues I ran into with visa immigration stuff where I actually had to come back to the States and she wasn't allowed to come back. So we kind of had to part ways for that summer. So what was going to be the first time in years where I just completely decompressed and turned everything off ended up being me self-isolating in my house in Nashville. And I really didn't have anything else to do. And that's when I started kind of experimenting with music again, okay. as kind of a pastime. And a lot of that music is what became piecemeal, which is the record that's coming out. So. Right. And well, one thing about kind of the pandemic now is this, we're all forced to reflect a little bit. So you kind of had that before the whole pan pandemic where you were pretty much by yourself for a couple of months. What did you, learn about your discover about your own creativity or, or how you perceived your your kind of craft um i learned how to kind of trust and value and believe in myself a little bit more um you know and not and not to be afraid of of exploration and and taking off any like kind of limitation because when you get into a sort of a system of you know, make a record tour, make a record tour, you kind of get locked into feeling like you should make, keep doing the same thing. You're kind of getting known for something. So you get, mm. but during that time, I didn't have any of that concept in my mind. So I was just like, I'm going to make music of whatever I want to do. I'm going to explore all different kinds of genres and do it all myself. And through the process, I started to reconnect with things that I really like other parts of myself that I was kind of neglecting, like being lost in this character of the last few years. Sure. And, um, doing, yeah, like I said, doing it all alone, you know, got me to a place where I trusted myself a little bit more. Cause I always had this mindset. I need studios or other people to make things happen to create the music or the records I want. And then I was like, actually, no, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm proving to myself that I can do it. And uh, I, yeah, I learned a lot from it. I mean, I'm really pretty grateful for that time as well. Is, is, there, is that where the line from uh, can we still be friends comes from? Uh, the line you used to make me feel one inch tall, but now I want to thank you all for giving me no chance but to believe in yourself. Like you say, you kind of had to crash and burn and then build up that confidence again. Yeah, uh, exactly. Because when I, <clears throat> when I kind of disconnected, and told everyone I needed a break from it all. You know, you, you people, you hear from people less. Um, sure. you, you sort of step out of the light for a second and, you know, you can feel a little bit sort of forgotten or, or neglected or whatever. Even if I was creating in my head, that was just a feeling I had. 
you know, like all these people in my life that I thought were close and tight and genuine, they all fleed when I had to kind of step back or things got challenging. Right. And at first that initial period where I took time off was really, um, vulnerable and self-conscious from that and kind of being on my own again and being lost. I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do now? I've been so secure in like a set thing. Now I'm like entering into the great unknown. So yeah, they started at zero basically. And then, yeah, I had to just slowly kind of build up to kind of even today, you know, with this record coming out and kind of that whole path back to rebuilding myself. So. Right. And then the music on Peace Wheels is quite diverse. It, it, it goes, uh, goes in very many directions. And like you said, you kind of had this self uh, rediscovery period. Did you discover certain elements of your musicality that you kind of had, uh, had let go of for a while, like hip more hip hop influences and those kind of more electronic influences? Yeah. Uh, as a kid, 90s hip hop, well, that's like the honestly the first music that I connected with as a kid. I mean, that's like my roots. So, and I always neglected it or felt like I couldn't explore those things. And this time around, I was like, let's go there. Let you love jazz. You're not a qualified jazz musician, but let's implement like some, some of that, you know, jazz chords or certain things that I can take from jazz and put it into what I do you know, or like the, the sort of spoken word stuff or right. even just pop, you know, I also kind of came up with like top 40 radio in the nineties, you know, the golden era of like one hit wonders and pop songs. And yeah, just not being afraid of any of that stuff. Let it all in. You know? Yeah. I think we're kind of of the same generation. So, so what were the, the ones that, that stuck out for you in that time? And because I think I grew up with a very similar uh, musical uh, diet. Yeah. I mean, my first CDs were Coolio, Puff Daddy and the Family, No Way Out, Mace, Notorious B.I.G., uh, all that stuff. Like okay. that stuff. Right. And then I got really in Eminem. I, I bleached my hair right. like every kid in middle school did. <laughs> um, and then around the same time, you know, I got really into skateboarding. And then I also got into like pop punk stuff, Blink-182, Green Day. And then where I'm from in New Jersey is like where that music was born. So the local music scene was like punk, hardcore, pop punk. Um, yeah. And so it was like, they're actually very different. Those two worlds of music. Sure. But that was what I was, I was, you know, in. Do, do you think it's fair to say, because I, I talk about this every once in a while with musicians that in this day and age, the, the kind of the lines, the genre lines are blurring very much, that, that people are more allowed to kind of venture into different areas. Yeah, it's one of the most exciting things about modern music that I'm really drawn to, because I feel like finally there's something in the mainstream or even what's becoming pop now that I can actually relate to. Mm. And that is sort of alien people that don't fit into a specific box. And, uh, I love, I love to see that. I mean, if it's good to just see in general lines being blurred in music genres, but just in all other kinds of identities, um, in humans and whatever, it's just sure. for you uh, going back to piecemeal then, um, what was the first song that kind of kind of got fleshed out that that you were actually proud of that you thought, well, this is going to make it on the record, and I'm I'm heading in the right direction. Um, "Hide Myself Behind You" was the it's the oldest song on the record. Um, I wrote it in February 2000, actually Valentine's Day 2018, okay. and that was the first time in a while that I had written something with with true like pop melody because stardust birthday party my third record came out later that year and if you listen to that um there's really not nothing melodic about that record mm. and um yeah hide was like the beginning for me and it was a song that i tried to demo and rearrange like time and time and time again but then when we figured that out for this this record that was kind of an aha moment that led to, okay, now I kind of know how to go about the rest. So this might be difficult, but do you remember what kind of mood or what kind of mindset you were in when you wrote that song? I do very clearly. Yeah. Um, 
So I wrote it Valentine's Day night, 2018, after uh, I was at a photo show gallery um, at a record shop in Nashville called Found Object. And a lot, because it was on Valentine's Day, a lot of couples came out as like their night out thing. It was cool. And I just remember, and I, you know, I was alone at the time and I, I just remember seeing all these people and I was so cynical about them because it's like, they're so full of shit, you know? everyone's kind of has this idea about love or relationships. And then, you know, when things get real or people see true colors, you know, they end up breaking apart because people, people tend to fall in love with like the idea of someone or how someone makes you feel as opposed to who they really are. And I'm just kind of observing these people like a cynical, like a, you know, like a Larry David thing. <laughs> sure. Oh, I'm full of shit. Um, and then I went home and wrote that song and that's what it is. It's like from the perspective of what people are kind of really doing in like the modern age of love and relationship. Um, and I wanted to make it, it's like sort of dark and cynical lyrically, but then it's like the happiest sounding song probably on the record. So, Because that's a very fascinating kind of uh, thing that's going on. And then I would say kind of that idea that we live in images or live in kind of these, these notions of, of things or how they are rather than what they actually are. And especially with uh, things like social media, I would say that has kind of exacerbated quite, quite a bit. Um, and now I found this quote on your uh, website, put this down and go look out the nearest window. 99% uh, sure you'll find everything is okay. So that idea of kind of disconnecting or not, not thinking in terms of, of what others might think or what, what you kind of ideologically think of about something, but just enjoying the moment. When, when did that kind of enter your psyche? I mean, that's something that I've tried to like go back to, mm -hmm. um, especially over the last couple of years with how much chaos there's been just globally, socially, politically, everything. Um, yeah. You know, when you tune into it and you're on social media, you're on the new, you're watching the news, it's just endless chaos and noise and negativity. And at some point, it just kind of occurred to me, very simple thing. Like I'm sitting here at my computer. I would be like absorbing all of this negativity. And then I would just turn slightly to the right and look out the window and be like, Yeah, everything is actually completely fine in reality. And how different those two things are, right? within each other is crazy to me. And so, yeah, it's just like a simple thing to go back to. Like when you start getting into the chaos, absorbing the negativity and the noise, just look out a window and you're like, the house across the street is just standing there still. There's no one actively trying to harm me right now. I'm breathing. I'm fine. You know, I'm safe in my house. Can change at any moment. But 99% of the time, you're actually good. You're fine. So. And then I think it's a, that's a very important thing to realize that, that we have control over our kind of how we see the world, that it's not just this is the world and it's horrible. And it's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I have to admit, I, I'm quite cynical as a person as well, but I have to kind of remind myself every day, but there's so much beauty in the world and you have to kind of uh, make sure you don't get bogged down in either one of them. I think if you are just happy all the time, that's not good at, uh, as well. So. Oh, man. <laughs> well, if we uh, get into more of the uh, spoken word type stuff, what was your approach uh, vocally on this record? Because you mentioned the hip hop in influence and you have some spoken word. How do you decide which kind of bits flow more poetically, which bits flow more as a song? How do you figure that out? Um, the, the first example that came to mind was the song Easter Island, which... I made all the music for that song and I had a sheet of words, not really structured at all, but that was sort of just an experiment where I had the music, I pressed record, I sat down, I had the paper in front of me and that was pretty much what came out. It was like half talked, half talk sung, half sang, like it was a mixture. And that was just kind of a part of the process of just experimentation. And then I ended up really keeping that most like predominantly in that song with the spoken word and sort of the fast talking thing. And then once I did that, I wanted to find other ways to sprinkle it throughout the record. So like, and can we still be friends? There's a pretty fast, like sub stream of conscious uh, 
section bridge in that song. And I added that sort of after the song was done. I was like, I want to put something like that in there. And so it gives me the opportunity to just write like a shitload of words that wouldn't normally fit into a melody and just kind of go off. And I love it because you don't really plan it. You kind of just do, you press record, you hold the paper and you just see how it comes out. And, uh, did it a couple of times and then on Hyde too, there's kind of a spoken bridge, all the same process, mm-hmm. you know, just throwing in a section where I'm like, let's just see what happens. And so, yeah, that's like, I love that stuff. I'm really happy. I was able to find room for it. And the interesting thing always with those uh, kind of stream of consciousness ideas is that maybe later on you'll find, figure out why you, you set those things or what. So have some, some of them, since these songs have been done by for a while now, uh, have these songs are, if any changed at all for you and how you see them? Absolutely. Um, Easter Island, another really big example of kind of taking on a new meaning mm-hmm. after the past year. Cause originally the song was just kind of, you know, comparing like parts within yourself to places in the external world and how the concept of like, you take yourself with you wherever you go. So you kind of got to get within, right. Get out of your own way kind of thing. And then obviously like the concept of going places and seeking things was changed a lot over the past year. So mm-hmm. then I, w- I added that last verse where I just list off all the places in real time that I was thinking about during the quarantine period, the places I wish I could go. Um, I know it happened, it happened a few times. Um, you know, one day crazy after dark was kind of like this fun, uh, you know, half joking song about isolation, mm-hmm. which you know, kind of became a very real thing. Uh, the most powerful thing on this record, I think, to tie all that together was all the punks are domesticated, the 2020 version. Right. Because that's an old song that I wrote back in 2015, 16, that was on heavy meta. And at some point during the quarantine, when I started to actually pick up a guitar and like play through songs again, I had this moment where I realized, holy shit, everything that I was talking about in all the punks from four or five years ago, all that stuff has basically come true this year. I had like this, I like freaked out. I was like, this is crazy. (laughs) Ah, uh, Some weird self-fulfilling prophecy thing. And that's when I felt compelled to add another verse about 2020 and then re-record the song because it felt more relevant now than even then. So a lot of that happened with this record where it got a new meaning later. So. And so living in the world that we live now and you haven't been initially forced into self-isolation by, I would say <laughs> border patrol uh, and then uh, kind of by this whole pandemic, how ready are you now to get out there again? Or do you, do you enjoy this kind of stillness? Uh, I have learned to really appreciate the stillness. I've learned how to relax, I think, as a person during this time, which I'm definitely grateful for, because I was always a person that could not sit still, mm-hmm. always felt like they had to be doing something or getting somewhere or making something. And I have finally learned how to just, you know, it's just couch and TV for a whole day, you know? Mm-hmm. Fuck it. Fine. It's good. You're okay. So that's good. And I have, I, there's a lot of things that I love about a simple, I don't love what's going on in the world, but I sure. like the concept of a simple life, even though it feels like Groundhog Day sometimes, wake up, go to bed at the same time, three meals. I mean, not much in between. It feels probably more like living at times than it does when I was constantly going, going, going and like burned out and not even really like aware or present for a lot of the things I was experiencing. But that being said, now that it's been kind of rejuvenated and everything's a new perspective, I can't wait to get back out and revisit some of these places that I've been that I couldn't fully be there for, go back to Italy and really just absorb people and the world again and not take it for granted. So, and of course, touring, I mean, shit, like, it would be nice to play a show and you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's, I'm right there with you. Let's hope um, people get to tour and safely, of course, but let's hope uh, the world figures itself out uh, in the coming months. And then feels like there's hope. <laughs> exactly. Ron, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Um, 
yeah and i hope everything uh, works out with the album thank you hopefully see you uh, over there maybe this year <laughs>